propagation of plants can be achieved by many successful methods. One of the most widely used and simplest methods of propagation is by germinating seeds. With a few exceptions, most of the plants used in agriculture and horticulture can be produced from seed. By learning about old as well as new seeding methods, we can choose the most suitable techniques for the size and complexity of our nursery. In this program, we'll not only demonstrate the skills and techniques of growing plants from seeds, but we'll also look at the science of seeds so that we can come to understand why these techniques work. First, we'll take a look at some basic terms and definitions necessary for understanding seed development. We'll see how vacuum technology is used to harvest as well as sow seeds in commercial operations. After reviewing the tools and supplies needed for planting seeds, we'll see the proper techniques for sowing seeds and go over the basic requirements for germination. We'll also look at the special techniques required for germinating seeds that are hard to sprout. Finally, we'll see how to manage the developing seedling from the initial stages of growth and through the transplanting process. Let's begin now by defining some basic terms and concepts which will help us understand the science of propagating plants from seeds. So what exactly is plant propagation? Plant propagation is the reproduction or multiplication of plants using seeds or other various tissues from a parent plant. To put it another way, plant propagation simply means making more plants. All of the many techniques of plant propagation fall into one of two main categories, seed and vegetative reproduction. In vegetative reproduction, also referred to as cloning or asexual reproduction, the plant is reproduced using a portion of vegetative tissues, such as a stem cutting. In reproduction by seed, also called sexual reproduction, male and female genetic material or DNA is combined through the processes of pollination and fertilization. This type of reproduction produces variable results with the new plants showing a mixture of traits from both parents. This seemingly random expression of inherited traits is called genetic variation. For example, these Linaria flowers also called toad flax, were grown from seed that was collected from a single red flower. So we can see that propagating more plants from the seed of this red flower results in plants with many different flower colors. This genetic variation in seeds gives the resulting plants the potential to adapt and survive adverse environmental conditions. Genetic variation in seed-grown plants also gives plant breeders the ability to select and develop new varieties that are resistant to pests, diseases, and other harmful elements. Another advantage to propagation by seed is that it gives us the opportunity to develop unique plants which may have a greater market value. Through cross-fertilization, we can combine the desirable traits from two different parents. The seed that is formed and the resulting plant is called a hybrid. Yet another benefit of growing plants from seed is the speed of growth and development displayed by many seedlings. This quality, often called seedling vigor, can be seen in the overall vitality 
of the developing plant. Now let's take a look at the anatomy of a developing seed. To the human eye, most seeds appear quite small and insignificant. But stored in each of these small, sometimes microscopic seeds, is enough food, energy, and genetic information to sprout and develop into a mature plant. Germination is another term for the sprouting of the seed. During germination, the roots and leaves of the plant break out of the seed covering. This covering around the seed is termed the seed coat. The first sign of germination is the bursting forth of a small root, which at this stage is termed the radical. Smaller still are the root hairs, which soon grow out from the sides of the emerging root. These very sensitive root hairs absorb most of the water needed for the developing seedling. Next, the cotyledons emerge from the seed coat. These first leaves contain stored food that is released to the developing plant. These cotyledons will eventually wither as the true leaves begin to produce food from sunshine in the fundamental process known as photosynthesis. Now that we're familiar with some of the basic terms used in seed propagation, let's look at the tools and supplies we'll need for planting the seeds. The first thing we'll need to do before we begin planting is to obtain some seeds. The seeds from wildflowers and many annual flowers can be collected from the garden and easily processed. Some common seeds which are easy to collect and use include coreopsis, lupins, sunflowers, and calendula. Collecting seed by hand is an interesting way to study the seed forming process but it's more common to purchase seed that has already been harvested and cleaned. Threshing refers to the removal of seed and chaff from the plant stock. This commercial threshing machine uses vacuum pressure to suck the dried marigold seeds off the mature flowers. Winnowing is the process of cleaning the chaff or hull from the seed until the hardened seed coat is revealed. For small quantities of seed, it's best to buy from one of the hundreds of retail companies which sell packets through the mail or in hardware and garden stores. Commercial nursery growers usually purchase larger quantities of seeds through any number of wholesale seed companies. The advantages of purchasing wholesale seed is that the price per seed is cheaper and the seeds are often tested to determine a germination rate. This germination rate is usually listed on the pack as a percentage and may even be guaranteed by some companies. Seeds should always be stored in a cool and dry place until the time of sowing. Commercial growers usually store their seeds in a refrigerator. If the seed packet is made of paper, be sure to place it in a plastic bag to protect the seeds from absorbing any moisture from inside the refrigerator. Although the germination rate will usually decrease over time, seeds can last for many years if stored under cool, dark and dry conditions. Once seed is obtained, we'll still need to get some sewing trays, germination media, labels, and watering equipment. 
For most seeds, plug trays will be the best containers for sowing. Plug trays or plug flats, often just referred to as plugs, are made up of many individual plastic cells. The plugs are joined together by the top edges of each cell, but are otherwise completely separate from the surrounding cells. Plug trays have become standard equipment for seed sowing in commercial horticulture for many reasons. One reason is that plugs provide easy calculation of germination statistics and seedling inventory. Plugs also prevent the spread of disease between individual cells and the resulting seedlings have a uniform and professional appearance. But perhaps the greatest advantage of plug trays is that a strong and stable root system is developed. This means that very little stress or transplant shock will result when shifting the developing seedlings. Open flats can also be used if plug trays are not available. Open flats or even small pots may be needed when sowing larger seeds, such as avocados. Instead of using field soils, we'll fill our trays or containers with a soilless germinating medium. A reliable sowing medium will have an even mixture of ingredients that are fine textured, lightweight, uniform, sanitary, and have a slightly acidic pH. The germination medium can be purchased ready to use or it can be made by blending equal parts of perlite and peat moss. The end result should have a balance between adequate water retention and good drainage. The medium should form a ball when moist, but easily break apart when poked. Before sowing, we'll want to prepare a misting nozzle or a water breaker with a very fine and gentle spray. This will be needed for watering the seeds immediately after sowing. Once equipped with seeds, sowing trays, labels, germination medium, and watering equipment, we're ready to begin sowing. Before we start sowing, we need to understand a few basic principles of seed germination. Seeds have the ability to remain inactive for months or even years until various environmental conditions are met which enable the seed to break out of the inactive state called quiescence. There are three vital elements required to awaken the seed from this resting state of quiescence, resulting in successful germination. Those requirements are water, proper temperature, and oxygen. During soaking or repeated watering, a seed can absorb many times its own weight in water causing the tissues to swell, which often breaks the seed coat. Once the seed is swollen with water, proper temperature and oxygen are needed to drive the physiological processes that enable germination. Some examples of seed which can be germinated by simply balancing out these three requirements include calendula, Coreopsis, marigolds, and nasturtiums. For our demonstration, we'll sow these seeds of Calendula officinalis into a plug flat using simple hand sowing techniques. The seed pack lists the germination temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius. This optimum temperature 
is already being provided by our stable warm weather. A general rule for planting depth is to bury the seed three times deeper than the thickness of the seed. Calendulas are a thin seed, so we'll only need to leave a few millimeters of space at the top of the plug cells. Use a brush to distribute the germination media evenly over the plug tray. Now we're ready to lay in the calendula seeds. We can do this by using the palm of our hand with a gentle flexing motion. We can also use the original seed packet smartly folded in the center of the opening flap. Tap the packet on the edge to move the seeds down and off the crease. This toothbrush box works well as a sewing tool because the seeds will line up in the corner of the box and drop out one by one. Hold the box at a slight angle and use a gentle tapping motion to release the seeds from the box. A similar tool can be made out of a finger brace which can be purchased from a drugstore. Tap it gently while moving it from plug to plug so that only one seed falls out at a time. There are also various hand seeding tools available from mail order nurseries. This handheld seeder uses a clicking vibration to move the seeds down the channel. The seeds pass through a gate which can be adjusted for different sizes of seeds. Once a calendula seed has been dropped in each cell, we can top off the plugs with a thin layer of germination medium. Vermiculite is sometimes used as this final covering. Vermiculite retains moisture very well and is especially useful for seeds that are sensitive to changes in moisture content. Now we're ready to water in the seeds. A misting nozzle provides the softest method of watering. The flat is now ready for the germination bench. Many flowers and vegetables can be sown directly into field soils. Although direct sowing into field soils is not usually as successful as growing inside a greenhouse, some plants such as California poppies do not transplant well and are much more successful if sown directly in the field. Commercial seeding machines use a vacuum system to pick up seeds from a holding bin and release them into plug trays. Small-scale nurseries would find this semi-automatic vacuum seeder sufficient for keeping pace with most sewing schedules. This machine requires a worker to manually operate the hand lever. Each time the hand lever is pushed down and forward, one row of a plug tray is planted. Vacuum seeding machines can be adjusted to handle most types of plug trays. This machine can also be calibrated for different seed sizes by changing the nozzles that pick up the seeds. The various colored nozzles represent different aperture sizes. Smaller nozzle apertures will be used for smaller seeds. The larger automatic vacuum seeders allow a commercial grower to rapidly sow vast quantities of seed. 
These fast-paced machines are specifically designed to be used with plug trays. Vacuum seeders work best with seeds that have been coated or pelletized. The yellow coating on these petunia seeds makes them uniform and allows the seed to easily attach and release from the vacuum cylinder. The coat on the seed may also contain a small dose of fertilizer or a fungicide to protect the germinating seed from diseases. The vacuum seeder drops one seed or pellet into each plug cell. The plug tray then moves along a conveyor belt and is covered with vermiculite or another medium. Finally, the plug tray is gently sprayed with water and moved to a germination chamber or directly into the greenhouse. While we're waiting for our newly sown seeds to sprout, let's take a look at the special germination requirements needed by some plants. Understanding the many germination requirements of different seed species is one of the most complex aspects of propagation by seeds. Some of the most common of these special requirements include scarification, soaking, stratification, light exposure, and darkness. Seeds such as lupins and some other plants in the pea family, Favaceae, have an extra thick or water-resistant seed coat. In cases such as this, scarification is necessary. This can be done by nicking or filing the seed coat or by simply clipping the tip of the seed coat with shears. In general, plants that require scarification will also benefit from an overnight soaking in plain water. Soaking the seed should result in a visible swelling of the seed. Stratification involves treating seeds with a period of cold, dark, and damp conditions, followed by the basic germination requirements of warmth, dampness, and oxygen. Stratification can be done any time of the year by placing sown seeds in a refrigerator and covering them with plastic for one to three months. This treatment effectively mimics what happens to seeds in nature during the changing of the seasons. Seed stratification is required by many flowering perennials and woody plants such as Campsus radicans, daylilies, Italian cypress, and many pine species. Gallardia, pomegranate, and fuchsias are examples of plants where light is required for germination. These seeds must not be covered by the germination soil mix. Sow seeds such as these of a pomegranate on the surface of a soil and water in gently with a misting nozzle so as not to bury the seed. Still, other plants require totally dark conditions for germination. Seeds of bachelor buttons and coriander will benefit from additional darkness after sowing. Any special treatment should be noted on the label of the flat, including the date the treatment was started. Typically, a label will include the sowing date and the plant variety name. After labeling out our flat of bachelor buttons, we'll cover the seeds with soil, add a black plastic sheet over the top of the tray, or place the sown seeds in a very dark room. As soon as these plants germinate, 
they must be immediately transferred to a well-lit location to continue proper development. Perishable seeds present a different challenge. Perishable or short-lived seeds must be sown immediately because their viability or their ability to germinate will decrease rapidly. Some examples of perishable seeds include primitive species like magnolia as well as tropical species such as strelitzia. Some of the less common techniques for overcoming germination problems include the need for fire or sometimes just smoke, the need for rinsing due to chemical inhibition from the seed coat, and chemical inhibition from other plants known as allelopathy, or simply the time required to overcome true dormancy. Now that we know how to deal with hard to sprout seeds, let's move on to the topic of seedling culture and transplanting techniques. The seeds will need to be checked periodically throughout the day to make sure that germination medium does not dry out. This is one of the most common forms of germination failure, especially with plugs. Some common pest problems encountered during germination are birds and rodents. Aviary netting is needed to prevent birds from eating the tender young sprouts as they emerge from the soil. If seeds are sown in a greenhouse or other closed structure, birds will not be a problem. However, traps may need to be set for mice or other rodents that will dig up the seeds before they have even sprouted. Once our seeds have sprouted, we will usually need to start gradually cutting back on the amount of water applied. At this stage, we need to be concerned with a group of fungi which cause a fatal disease known as damping off. Damping off occurs when a young seedling suddenly wilts or topples over near the soil line. On close examination, we find a dark ring around the damaged stem. There are many soil-borne fungi which can cause damping off. Some of the more common types include Rhizoctonia, Pythium, Phytophthora, and Fusarium. These fungi can be controlled by fungicides but good horticultural practices can also prevent the conditions which encourage damping off. As we mentioned, starting out with a sterile medium will prevent many disease problems. Watering should be done early in the morning so the soil surface has a chance to dry off before evening. One technique for combating plug diseases is to brush off the seedlings in the afternoon. Many seedling diseases, such as powdery mildew, will start as fungal spores which germinate in the film of water found on the leaf surface. This brushing technique will knock off any standing water so that the leaf surface might dry off before evening. In addition, providing good air circulation and controlling excess humidity will help control many diseases including damping off. As soon as there are one or two sets of true leaves and the roots have reached the bottom of the tray, then the seedlings are ready to be transplanted. Plugs can be removed from the tray by using tweezers a small shrimp fork, or by pushing the plug up through the hole in the bottom of the cell. Water the plants into their new containers 
even if the soil was wet before transplanting. This ensures good contact between soil and roots and also reduces transplant shock. When the plants have grown into their larger containers and can easily hold on to the medium when removed from the pots, then they are ready for transfer into the field. If the plants have been grown in the greenhouse, it's important to set the plants outside for a week or two before transplanting into the field. This technique is called hardening off. In this program, we've looked at the many aspects of propagation by seeds. We've studied the basic anatomy of germinating seeds, as well as the process of germination. The essential tools and equipment for sowing were also demonstrated. We've seen how vacuum machines are not only used to harvest seeds in the field, but also to sow seeds in commercial nurseries. We've studied many sowing techniques and seedling culture and finished by showing how and when the seedlings should be transplanted. We hope the combination of botany, biology, and horticulture covered in this program has sparked the interest of our viewers to continue studying the fascinating world of seeds.